Good morning to everyone online. Good morning, E3. It's good to see you. Um, I was just thinking it's kind of a shame that I don't know more people's names right off the top of my head <laughs> five weeks in. Um, if you guys want to stick around and chat after, that'd be, that'd be fine. But I was feeling a little bit sad that I didn't. Usually I get to this point in the semester and I've handed back like, you know, four or five quizzes and maybe a test. And I've had some conversations with students and it's just, uh, that's not the same. So <laughs> anyway, um, it's good to have you uh, here. Today we'll be looking at sections two, three, and then we skip four and five, we'll go to six and go to seven as well. Um, but before I begin on that, are there any questions on anything? Questions about the class in general, questions about material? Not from these three, anyone online? All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, section 2.3, it's titled Getting Information from the Graph of the Function. I'm going to draw the graph from number 10. But I'm actually going to go through questions from lots of different problems, just because um, I don't want to draw a thousand different graphs. That's that I don't want to draw four or five graphs, only two answer the same questions. Um, so I'm going to make this one dotted. That helps you separate the two. This one that is dotted is F. The one that's solid is G. And let's just put on some notes here. Okay, so uh, several of the questions in this section are just asking um, what, where the largest value of a function is based on its graph, or where the smallest value is, um, or what is the net change on some domain interval, uh, what is, uh, where are their maxima, where are their minima, we call these things extrema, so they're the extreme values of, of a function. Um, good morning, come on in. And, uh, and so we're going to answer all of those questions just based on number 10's graph, like I said, instead of drawing several graphs. So, um, Here's the start question. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Which is bigger? F of six or G of six? So when, we, when we're answering a question like this, we know that we've got our functions graph here, and the number in there is actually the input on the domain. So you can go right over one, two, three, four, five, six, and then just trace up until you get to this height, which is, it looks to me like one, two, three, four, five and a half, maybe. Six, five and a half, maybe. And that is the value of G of six. G of six is five and a half. About. And then the other one, F of six, way up here. That's the point six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven and a half, maybe eleven. So six, eleven, I'll estimate. That is the value of F of six. 11, G of six, five and a half. So which one's bigger? F of six. The easy way to see that is which graph is taller. Right? Which one's higher up? Okay, but there's the explicit way of computing that. Uh, question B for 10 is the same, but we're answering it with regards to three, and it looks like they're equal to three, so we're gonna skip that one. Uh, question C is more general. It asks, find all of the values of 
where x equals g of x. So we're just going to write down a list here. So we already pointed out the first from part B. So we notice when x is 3, we trace up and we see, actually maybe not quite 3, maybe like 3.2, we see that they are equal, the graphs intersect. So there's the first one. Uh, the next one where the graphs intersect would be right up here. Trace that straight down as best we can, and that's maybe 7.2. I'm just estimating here. And then we keep going, and they intersect again here. We go, we drop straight down, we get maybe here. So 7, 8, 9 point, uh, 7. So there are three values where these graphs intersect, and that's those locations, the intersection locations, that's where the graphs are equal, where the function values are equal. Um, we can always think of function values as heights. So when they intersect, they have the same height, obviously, for the same input. So there we go, there's question C. Questions D and E. Uh, where is f of x less than or equal to g of x? And d is the opposite direction. Where is f larger than g? Uh, so, from question C, we've got a nice partition or uh, breaking up of our input space here. We've got this value 3.2. We've got this value 7.2. We've got this value 9.7. Where our graphs cross. And so before this value, one of the two graphs is taller than the other. In between these two, the same thing happens. One's bigger than the other. Same thing, same thing. So all we're going to do is we're going to use these values uh, from C to sort of split up our inputs here. And our inputs start at 2 and end at, it looks like, what I draw, 10, 11, 12. We're not going to have anything above 12. We're not going to have anything above 2. So that's the dotted line. So F is smaller from 2 to 3.2. 3.2 because we've got an equal sign here. Uh, here, if we've got f as being larger, so we're not going to write that in. From 7.2 to 9.7, the dotted line is below. So we're going to glue this together with 7.2 to 9.7. And then for the rest of the time, f is larger than g. Okay, so e. Very similar question. It asks where is G greater than F? And all we're going to do is we're going to take what's not here and we're going to put it in, right? So here F is larger, so here G is bigger. Uh, excuse me. I meant to switch this around. I didn't switch. I switched the letters, I didn't switch that around. Okay, so where is G less than? It's here. So from 3.2 to 7.2, we're going to use curly parentheses now because we can't include the endpoints where they are equal. And we're going to glue this together with 9, 7 to 12. And we can include 12. That's pretty much all question 10. Um, now I'm just going to fire some questions at you and you can answer. All right. What is the maximum value of F on this graph? You can estimate if you like.
think of maximum, we should be thinking about maximum output. What is the maximum output of the function f? What is the maximum height? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That's the point where it reaches its maximum, right? Yes. Okay, that's too much information. All I'm asking for is what's the max, right? Uh, if I asked you what's the most money you ever had, I don't care when it was, right? That's the x information. So he, he says, not incorrectly, 12, 12, that's the point, but this is the maximum value. This is the when. Okay. Good point. Good point. It's good to know to do that, though, and know how to do that, of course. So 12 would be the highest. How about G? Sure, I'll go, I'll go with that estimate. It's like right here. So we trace it over. It's close to 11. All right, somebody else, what's the smallest, the minimum value of F? Where is it the shortest? Yes, sir. Yeah, one and a half, right here. And for G? That's hard to estimate. It's so far away from the axis. Do either of you two have a guess? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Because number one, I can't draw a straight line to save my life. Right? And number two, that's a really far away, <clears throat> really far away from this. So I'll go with four. Yeah, we'll go with four. Sure. Ish. Four point ish. Something like this, you know? Um, okay. So what we just looked at are some things called global maxima, right? Over every single input, what's the biggest value we can find? Okay? Like I asked, what's the most money you've ever had? That's different than what's the most money you've had in the last week, right? That's not global, that's, that's a smaller scale thing. That's a local question, local in time. How many local maximas are there for the function f and for the function g? How many local maxima are there for both functions? Local just means in a small zone, it's the biggest. In a small zone, everything around it is smaller. So I, I look at our global again and I ask, is this also the biggest thing nearby? Yes, right? This one clearly is this. If I look in a little zone around it, this is clearly the biggest thing around. So there's one. Is there another spot for the function f that is the biggest thing around? Well, we just trace it back. You know, and we say, oh, this looks like a good candidate, because if I look around here, it's the biggest thing around. So it's a, it's a local maximum. So there's two, right? And the same thing for G, there's a local max here. There's a local max here. This is the global as well. So there's two, both of them. This is the difference between uh, uh, the biggest kid on the block and the biggest kid in the world of all time, right? That's just what we're talking about here, splitting hairs between exactly when we have the largest item. Um, here's some harder questions. 
I'm going to erase C through E for this and pop the thing up. Question is, where is the function g increasing? Where is the function g increasing? Sure, that estimate we made before. Four and a half, five, I don't know exactly when. Five-ish, I can go with four, although that appears a little bit off. Four and a half, asterisk, to 10. Okay, what kind of endings do I have here? This is an interval. What kind of endings do I have? Is it increasing at the left side and the right side, or is it not increasing and neither decreasing at the end point? Do you understand my question? Right up here. Is it getting bigger or smaller or neither? Or both? Yeah. Neither. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like. It's like that moment in space when you're floating. You know, you're, the plane's going up and then the plane stalls and the plane comes down and you're like floating and you're not going up and you're not going down. You're sitting there, just floating in your So it's, it's these on both ends. This is kind of a big idea for calculus later on. Increasing just means the graph is rising. And in calculus, you, you're constantly looking for these things that have no increasing, no decrease. Values. It's a yeah, big question. Uh, and I could ask you where things are decreasing, but it looks like that's fine. So that's it. That's it for 2.3. Any questions upon 2.3's upon questions? Yes. Um, on the homework, it wants us to use square brackets because I was thinking the same thing on the homework that it wasn't increasing or decreasing at those. The, the minimum and the maximum. Okay. But it wants to use square brackets. Okay. Hmm, I will write an email and ask why they want that. But uh, maybe it's. Hmm, I will write an email. It's, it would not be the first time I've, I've answered or asked an email this Ask them a question through email this semester. On one of them, I don't know if there's one someone here, they. For the distance formula, it was something like this. D minus D. This is what they wanted, but a student put this in. And they counted it wrong. It's literally the same thing. The value of this is the same as the value of this. The value of this is the same as the value of this. The order of that subtraction doesn't matter because you're squaring it and moving anything on so. its own. Okay, well, I will say this is more technically correct. I would say this is what WebSign wants, so that's what you should put in for now. <laughs> okay, note that if you're, if you're listening. Yes? Nope. Questions grabbed from what kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. So if, uh, we have a question, email. Email. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Just shoot me an email with the screenshot of the question. I'll, I can go back and then manually create it. Okay. Yep. Great question. Yeah. Um, 
Last year when we did this whole new switch to this whole thing last semester, um, I just went through every test anyway, looking for things in the cases where students didn't even email me. Uh, and there were points that I gave back, but um, it, it's to your benefit to email me just in case I don't have any time to do that. Any other questions on 2 3? Thank you for that comment. Thank you for that question. Anything else? Okay, the next section is 2.6. I was speaking with a peer last night about 2.6. He was arguing that 2.6 is possibly one of the most important sections of the book. And maybe even just of, well, of the book and maybe of the, of the class in general. 2.6 is about transformations of functions. So if I gave you some function, uh, how can you manipulate it in order to to achieve some end, or how can you graph some random function based on only simpler functions that you know of? Um, just to give a couple of those, we know of functions like this, that's the absolute value function. We know of functions like this, parabola. We know of even odd things here. You know, odds look like this, evens look like this. Uh, maybe with some wiggles in the middle. Uh, maybe we know the natural log function like this, and we know the exponential function looks like this. These are the general ones, and I'm not drawing in a line, although I can, I will, here we go. It looks like that. These are the basic ones, right? From these, how can you get any old function, or how can you graph any old function? These are called transformations, uh, and so I'm going to go through several problems here and hit a, a vast majority of these. The first one is, suppose you have a graph uh, f and describe how the graph of each function can be obtained from the graph of f. So, question 11. You have a graph of f. Okay, you just got to picture this in your mind. The book doesn't give you a thing, it doesn't give you a formula. You've got some graph for f. What happens when you plot this? You've got a random function f and its graph. What happens if you shift the inputs by 5 and you shift the outputs by 2? happens to the graph. Right, five and up two. Right, five, up two, correct. Okay, this shifts right. Five. This shifts it up. Very good. B. It's just a different transformation. Someone else can answer this one. What happens to this graph? Same function f, but now we've done this to it. We've added one to every input, and we've subtracted one from the end result. Yeah, don't be shy. Correct. Correct. Very good. We get it for us. Okay. 
Okay, 21. Okay, so our, our uh, first one for 21 here is uh, absolute value of x. And part A is x plus 2 minus 2. Our normal function is absolute value of x. And we're supposed to, you're supposed to tell me what happens when I wrap this. Uh, when I, I'm sorry. What's the relationship between this graph, which is this one? And this one. What happens with kind of like this, this type of idea, but now we're dealing with known. The lesser question would be, could you write it like this, this sort of way? G of x equals that of what? What did we plug into the absolute value? X plus 2, right? Instead of just plugging in x, we plug in x plus 2. That's, that's this. x plus 2 in absolute values is f of x plus 2. And then we subtract it. So, here we go. What did we do to the graph of that? We shifted it left 2 and down 2. That's it. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, part B. I believe it's still the absolute value function, and we just swap. Swap the twos. How do we get the graph of h from the graph of f? We shift it. Right to and up to. Yep. Exactly. You could rewrite it like this, but with that, I think that's enough. Right? Just having done this, I think it's enough. See it like that. So, uh, I mean, I could go one step further and actually do this for you. Absolute value function looks just like this. That's F. Okay. G of X, we already said it's shifted left to, so one, two, and down to one, two. So here is this point moved down here, and every other point gets moved down as well. That's G. Okay. It, it overlaps F here, and H is very similar. It's shifted to the right too, but also one too. So it'll be here or less H. I hope you're starting to see the power of this if you haven't studied this yet. But all you need to know is the basics. That's the gist here. You need to know the basics. And then you can grab lots of other functions. Right? Yes. Uh, how come when it's if we're subtracting two, we're going to the right. graph you know, right? Did I go to the no, like why why are you doing that? Is that, is that 
x minus 2. This, why does this shift it right? Why does it shift it right? The oh, okay, okay, good question. Yeah, it has to deal with um, with something that I guess I'll explain here. It's a great question, very common question. You're probably not alone. Um, certainly, in the history of all students who are not alone. So, why does subtracting or adding? Um, to the input, the effect it does, right? Why does adding and subtracting to the input do what it does? So in parentheses, add it left and subtract it right. I like to think of subtraction and addition of the input um, kind of like this, uh, this idea that we've used from number lines. So, so this is our original x, right? So we've got zero here in the middle. We've got one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So normally what we do is, you know, we take these values and we plug them in without modification. However, when we subtract things, what is happening to this line? If we subtract from these values, what happens? We make them all smaller, right? So maybe just we'll go here, x minus two. I'm gonna overlay this second number line right on top, x minus two. Zero is still here, right? But zero is not zero. Zero gets moved back to here to negative two. Right? Two is the new zero. We've grabbed the whole number line for input and we've slid it over to the left. Right? Okay, there's the key. You have this, this idea that uh, uh, that this maybe should be moving the thing left, right? But in reality, what we're doing is we're shifting the, the inputs to the left, which has the result of the graph moving to the right. And this is the idea in the picture, two is the new zero. So in order to plug in zero for the function, we need to plug in something further to the right because the whole input has been shifted left. Yeah? Okay, so just to give you a picture here, H was shifted to the right. In order to get this point, which was what we got when we plugged in zero initially, because of the subtraction and the shifting of the whole X axis left, we need to pick something to the right, further to the right, to be the new zero point. So graphically, it has the, the, the effect of moving it to the right. Okay. Uh, and then plus is the same thing, but in the opposite logical sequence. Right. We're increasing the axis, so we're moving the whole x axis to the right, which means we need to pick things further to the left in order to get the original back, right? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a confusing thing not intuitively obvious. I had a professor that used to say, it's IOPC MCO. Intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. This is not that, okay? It's not intuitively obvious. Uh, 22 was the next one that I wanted to go through. 22 uses the square root function. I wrote 21 there after starting the problem. That was question 21. This one's question 22. The original function is root x. And the question is a, what happens when, what happens to this graph 
when we adjust it in this following way, square root of x plus or minus one, it really doesn't matter, it is plus one, and then negative here. Part b, different function, h of x gets the square root of negative x. I'm going to go with minus one, that's my guess. It's still plus one, wouldn't you figure? Okay, so how do we get g from the graph of f? What do we do to the function of f? There's an easy part of that and a hard part of that. Yeah. Right one up one. Right one up one? Well, in order for right one, we would need an x minus one underneath this. But we've got nothing underneath there, just the x. So there's no right, but up one, yes. So this, up one, correct. So this is what you think means move right one. Maybe, maybe I make this a little easier. How's that graph different than that graph? How is this graph, negative root x, different from root x? Yes. The negative x is on the Say it one more time, a little louder. Oh, oh, you think it does this. Oh, mm -hmm. You're getting at something. You're, you're a step ahead of us. You're answering part B's question. Not that, but you've got the right idea. It's a reflection of sorts. Just not that. Think about it like points, right? Plug in four, what do you get? Negative two. Plug in four, what do you get? Two. One's above the ax axis, one's below the x-axis. Plug in nine, you get negative three. Plug in nine, you get positive three. One's above, one's below. So it is a reflection. Here's the original, here's the new one. Okay? And then we add the plus one back in, and that has the effect of shifting this up one. So it starts here instead. All right, what happens on the second part, part B? <laughs> what does this input adjustment do? Yeah, yeah. Did you have a question? You looked a little confused. Okay. Yeah, one, to play devil's advocate, actually. One question I commonly get is, uh, this is not possible. We can't plug in negative numbers. Had you thought about that? Yeah, right. The result would be imaginary. We need to use additional dimensions to graph this. Is this a problem? Did I pull a quick one on that? Yeah. 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 Now with this negative, now we can't plug in positives. So this, this whole like flipping about the y-axis business, that's what this is. Every negative becomes positive, and every positive becomes negative now. So we've, we've adjusted the inputs to the other side of the x-axis. So this is this. Okay. It's taking the original 
root x and flipping it over. And then we add one, which just shifts it up one. So we've just moved it up one and reflected about the y-axis. Here we reflect about the x-axis and shift up one. Cross. Oh, good straight. Uh, I'm going to go with this. One, two, two, I think it's one. Shift up one. Cross. Y axis. Right, great. Good. Yeah, to reiterate, to say it again, you're starting to see, I hope, how just knowing some basic things about the original graph or the original function and how modifying the input and output, how that can provide you with a, a lot more examples or a lot more graphs or uh, results. So 45 is the next one. This is the same type of question that deals with parabolas. Just trying to get a, a slew here of these things. So we've got f of x equals three squared plus one number. I'll write five. Okay, what does the graph of that thing look like? Well, the original x squared is like this. Right? This is a Parabola. It's something with x is squared and then plus five. So what does this do? The minus three. We know in general it shifts our inputs to the left, which means the graph is shifted to the right. So one, two, three. Looks like that x minus 3 squared plus 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, looks like that. That's the end result. You take the x squared graph that you know and love and hold dear to yourself, you just move it to the right and up 5. Right 3, up 5. It should be that fast. Right. Uh, 42 going backwards. Are there questions at the point? I know I'm running through this fast. Is this too slow still? No? About right. All right. Forty-two uh, wants us to graph negative five root x. It's similar to what I just erased, but it has a slight change. There's a negative five instead of just a negative sign. Does anyone remember what this multipl a multiplication does by some number bigger than one? What that does to your graph or your results? Ladder is easier to answer. Multiplying things by five makes them bigger, right? If I gain a lot of weight and I was five times heavier, I would be a very big man, very big man, right? I wouldn't be walking back and forth like I am with me. So this has the result of increasing the size of root x. We already know what negatives do. Right? flip things down, right? 
So if our original graph is root x, I think we can see that. Looks like this, where the first point at one is actually at a height of one. You input one, square root of one is one. Square root of x times five, when you input one, gives you one, two, three, four, five. So now the graph looks like this. That's square root of five, or excuse me, five square roots of x. And then the negative sign flips it all down. called a vertical stretch. It just takes this original graph and its outputs and stretches them up and out. Um, if we picked a number between one and negative one, it would have compressed the graph. Okay. Well, that's it for 2.6. It's all about how to make new functions from old ones. Uh, using simple transformations like adjusting the input, like shifting the output, like multiplying by some factor the output, or multiplying by some factor the input. There's another, I think, topic about even oddness, uh, which is not too difficult to, to get. Um, but that's pretty much it for 2.6. Can I move on to 2.7 or do you have questions? 8.48. Wow, we're doing great. Yeah. Uh, about even and odd. Yeah. What does that? What is, does that have to do with the the exponent? Is that why it's like even and odd? The exponent makes it even. Yeah, at a very simple level, it does. Um, but when functions get more complicated, no, it doesn't. So. Uh, is that an even function? Yes, definitely even function because that power is even. Is that an even or a non function? Well, it's got an even power and an odd power, right? So there's an additional check we need to do. There's something more we should look at because it's possible it's not either. Even and odd. Describe a certain type of symmetry. Okay, there, there's a, it's, a, it's kind of getting at the idea of like something similar to symmetry. Like you can draw a line down the middle and it's the same on both sides. Or uh, you know, you can draw a line horizontally through it and it's the same on both sides. These are symmetry topics. These two things describe types of symmetry. Okay, even symmetry is symmetry symmetric about y-axis, okay? The way you can check that numerically is if you've got a function and if you want to see if it's even, you want to see if it's symmetric about the y-axis, you think about it in a picture, This is what we have on the right side. I take a random x and I get this height here. If it's symmetric about the y-axis, when I plug in negative x, what should I get? The same output. So I should get the same height. For any x I choose, I should get the exact same height. So to check if something's even, You plug in negative x to the function equation like this. You plug in negative x and you see, you simplify it and you see if it's the same as the original. In this case, it's not. If I plug in negative x to this, this would remain unchanged, but this would be negative because of the cubing. 
That's not the same. We've changed it a little, so it's not even. Okay. For odd, there's a specific type of change that's being looked for. What you're looking for is 180 degree rotation about the origin. So whatever we have here is rotated all the way down here. And the way to check for that is when you plug in an X, you get a height Y here. So whenever you plug in negative X, you should get negative Y here. So whenever you plug in a negative X, you should get negative original. So it's two special kinds of symmetry that have special names, even in odd, probably because they originated from polynomials with even and odd powers. Um, but there's lots of other functions, uh, natural log of x, e to the x. We could start talking about cosines and tangents and sines and all these other kinds of functions. And then lots of things that aren't even like this, right? Um, 1 over x, rational functions. We talk about lots of different things. Um, they don't have powers, right? At least not in this form. They don't have powers. So how can you, you can't just look here and see, oh, it's a lot, it's even, or, or oh, it's a lot, you know. Or it's neither, as is as in this case. That's probably more than you were asking for, but there you go. Okay, two seven, unless there are other questions. Okay. Two seven was on combining functions. Um, I'm going to erase that too. Don't need that. Combining functions. Uh, I know there's some computer science people in here, but maybe everybody also has done some, some coding in the past. Um, we'll talk about something called composition functions, which is essentially like a recursion relation where you take the input of one thing and you, you in, put it into the input of the next thing. So recursion for you computer science people is you do a process and then the output of that process goes into the input of the same process and you keep doing this over and over and over again until you end it. So input sum x, output sum y. That's what happens in a function. Right? But this y becomes the new x the next time we do it. That's recursion. So the output becomes the input. And then that output becomes the new input. Okay? Yes. Good. Uh, we're talking about in 2.7 combining functions. this is recursion right you're just taking a function and you're using it as the input of the new function you're combining the two together so we're going to do the exact same thing we won't call it by that name recursion right but a rose by any other by any other name is still a rose in math we're going to call it composed or composition of functions one function is input to another function we're composing the functions together. Okay, there's other things that we can do to combine functions. This is one example. Others are multiplying functions together. That's pretty easy. The output of one multiply by the output of the other. Uh, dividing functions, also rather simple. You take the output of one function, you divide it by the output of another. We can add and subtract. These things we're all familiar with. This is the new thing from two, seven. So 28, I'll start us off slowly. We have the functions 2x minus 3. The function 
x is 4 minus x squared. And 28a asks, what is f of f of 2? This is recursion. This is composition. We've taken the function f as the input to the function f. calling function, the same function over and over again. So let's just do this. Uh, just like with normal arithmetic, where there's lots of parentheses and powers, and you have to use the PEMDAS order operations, you do the same thing here. You start on the inside, and you work your way out. So we want to know what f is of some f. Well, we better figure out what that is. So we want to know what this f is at 2. Oh, great, we can compute that. So this inside. F of 2 is what you get when you plug in 2 here. This is F of 2 times our input 2 minus 3. So this is F of 2 here. Right there. That's 4 minus 3, that's 1. What is that? Well, we just look back up here again. 2 times 1 times 3 times 1. Not too bad. Perfect, all wrong, but recursion only refers to a function calling itself, right? You seem to know what's going on here. Recursion. I only really know I found the code in. Yeah. I found it. I know how to get it. I'm not really sure. I know a lot of different points, but I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I'm fairly sure that recursion is a function calls itself. Yeah. Yeah. A variable calls itself, I guess. A variable, sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in math compositions, any function calls any other function. And we just chain them together, just compose them together. So I think it's a bit more of a general statement. 48. We're going to look at, oh, sorry, let's, I didn't do part B. Part B, G of G of 3. Give you just a minute to work this one out. See if you can get the result. One. Right, it's not too difficult uh, to actually evaluate these things. Um, it's just plugging a number into a function and then taking the output and plugging it into the next function, chaining them together like that. More difficult thing. Spend the last 18 or so minutes on 48. 
we've got two different functions. Is 4x, to be 6x minus 5, and p of x is x over 2. And we're asked to find f of g, g of f, g of g and f of f. This is the shorthand notation for what we have here. This little circle. You can say the word of, or you can say the word composed with, or is composed with. This little circle means that. And all it means is to do this. The second one is your input to the first one. So this is g of g of three. G circle G three. Um, so I'll go ahead and illustrate that here. Can I erase this line now? Turn it in a minute. So let's go the foggiest one. F of G. Do that. All right. So G is our input to F. So this, we could rewrite like this. Maybe like this, f of g of x. Right, we've got this, this x here that we're still plugging into these things. So this is literally just saying, take, got an extra front here. And we're flying around a little bit, a little too free with my parentheses today, sorry. Okay, so we're saying take G and plug it into F. So let's do this. F is 6X minus 5. So we're going to take G and replace this X with it. This is the original function F. But instead of plugging in X, we're going to plug in the function G of X, which is X over 2. Okay. G is the input to F. F's original input was X. Now our new input is this whole function, X over two. Then we simplify. I don't think you really need it. You would simplify this anyway, right? Six is really six over one, and then you simplify it to be three x, which will bring up. Okay. The next one, g of f. We're going to take the function g, and then, and instead of plugging in this x. We're plugging in the whole function f of x. f of x is 6x minus 5. So g of x, just to do this sort of step by step, g of x looks like this, but instead of x, we're plugging in the whole function f of x. So everywhere I see that x in the original one of g, I'm plugging in the whole thing here. That's it. Um, we could do G of G and F of F, but these are pretty simple examples. So I'll, I'll not do those now and we'll move on to something harder. But it's just pretty clear what we're doing, right? I tried to get out of here. The output of some function is the new input to the function, right? So instead of just using a normal x, we're, we're actually using an entire expression as the input 
we're replacing the old x's with the entire expression. Okay, before I move on though, are there any holes in the domain of these new functions that we created? Okay, for this function, the domain is the whole reals, right? And this one, same. Have we created a new beast with holes in the domain? No. This is still a line, all reals. This is still a line, all reals. We, through this composition, we have not ruined anything. We've not created something that is altogether different from what we had initially. I ask that because that can happen. Which is why the next problem is 51. Function f of x is 1 over x. Our second function, g of x, is 2x minus 1. Right, before we move on, domain of both of these. What do we got? Domain for x. Yes. All real numbers except zero. Okay. G is all real, so it's just a line. All real numbers. So let's see what happens when we start plugging things together. All right. Um, let's do F of G first. We're going to take g of x as the input to f of x. So here's f of x, and everywhere we see that x, we're going to write that whole expression. 1 over 2x minus 1. It's a great question because that is extremely simple to write down, but now here's the harder question. What's the domain? I say it's hard, I ask a question, somebody inevitably is just going to get it right, just immediately. So, what's the demand of this new thing we've created? Yeah, there's this issue of one half. That would give us zero in the denominator. Is that it? The next one comes down, this, this one rather, the next number, comes down to a matter of perspective. If I wrote this down, and ask you what the domain was. That's correct. The real numbers, except for one half. Right? But how did you get this in this problem? Think of this as a computer would think of this. I input into G. I get something out. I plug that into F. What can't you plug in for G? Zero. What is F going to do if you plug in zero here and G is like, I don't know what to do with that. Right? Syntax error right here and then boom, F can't handle that. I mean, it stares at it like you would if your computer gave you that error. So, G can't handle zero. 
So the composition of these two can't handle it. This is chaining together things. This is the final expression, but these functions carry with themselves their original domains, right? It's the handoff of one value to one function to the next. If one function doesn't know what to do, it can't very well give that unknown thing off. So what are we doing now? G of it. Again, this is great because it's super simple to do. G is our function on the outside, and as input, we're going to use this. So at G of f of x is simple to write as 2 times 1 over x, which is 2 over x minus 1. What is the domain? Two. It's two. All real numbers except two. If we plug in two, we're going to get two divided by two here. That's one. One minus one is zero. All real numbers. All real numbers. What about zero? Yeah, we, we got to be careful, right? These things are fishy. We can plug in anything we want to G, right? Right, we can plug in anything we want, all reals. So right away, all reals. But there's an issue here. Because what we're plugging in is the output of this. And what does this output with zero? Big fat nothing, right? Who knows? So, Thank you for your efforts. You got there. This is not easy, so you got there. Good job. It's interesting. This one half pops up in this situation. The zero stays through. The one half pops up there. We can create new problems for ourselves in composition. I think about a computer and I think about how many programs are feeding information back and forth to each other, or even within a function, even within a single program, how many functions are getting things back and forth together. It's no wonder there aren't, it, well, it's a big mystery to me how everything works so wonderfully well. That's what I was trying to say. The possibilities for mistakes is up there. Okay, 51. Nice. That's 51. I ask it every time, uh, just because I have to. It's like uh, written into my contract. Is 51 prime? All five of you hesitated, and everyone online hesitated. Field prime, right? 41, field prime, is prime. 61, field prime, is prime. 71, field prime, is prime. 81, Everyone knows that's nine squared. So definitely doesn't seal prime. But 51. Seals prime. Isn't prime. It's the smallest number that feels prime, but actually isn't, by the way. Mathematical fact. Smallest number. Prime. Fifty-two. I changed it. I don't care. I changed it. I changed it to x minus four. No, that's okay. Um, this will be easier. Um, so our original function is x squared for f. Our original function for g is root x minus four. We are going to again compose these two together and ask questions about domain. 
and let's see what time do we have? 16. We've got four minutes left. We can do this problem. We'll probably call it there. All right. So G is our input to F. So I'm going to write down the form of F. F was something squared. And I'm going to put G into that, that blank space. Root of F minus 4. I'll simplify it. There it is. That's log of x of g. Domain. Great guess. We're always going to start there. So this is a great place to begin. Yeah, we can plug anything we want in here, right? Yeah, anything we want. How did we get there? We square rooted something. And then we squared it. Can we square root just anything? No. F receives the output of the function g. Okay, so what can G handle and what can't it handle? G cannot handle anything smaller than four. If you plug in a number less than four here, you get the root of a negative and you get an imaginary result, which is fine, but not for web assignment, <laughs> not for this class. So the domain here, if we're keeping ourselves within the real values, is I'll write it as an interval this time. Uh, or I'll, no, I'll write it like I've been doing. For reals, minus negative infinity to four. For the reals without that interval. Okay. So what, what do we have here? But well, we certainly could not have plugged in anything less than four. Because then G would have gotten an imaginary result, and it would have passed off an imaginary result to F. The result is imaginary still. Well, not really, but okay. Keeping ourselves within the reals entirely throughout the problem, we have to maintain this. So the reals minus those negatives. All right, next one, G of F. It's rather simple to write. Here's the form of G, outside function. The inside function is X squared, so we're going to replace the X with X squared. Then we're just going to ask ourselves what the domain is and we'll be done. Well, is there anything that F cannot handle from the beginning? That's where this all starts, right? The inside function. If it can't handle something, it can't pass it off. So, is there anything it can't handle? No. You can square any real number and get a real number. So this is all real. So there's no limitations on F. So the only possible limitations will be the limitations we get here from G. So what we need to have is that X squared is bigger than four or equal to four. Or Yes, you're right. What other numbers could you square and get a number bigger than four? Perfect. Negative two works. Negative. Give me another one. 
something you can square to get something bigger than four. Negative one. Negative four? Four, negative four, yeah. Negative four squared is 16. 16 is bigger. So yes. We have this as well. X can be anything bigger than two or less than negative two. Anything in between? G wouldn't know what to do with. Because we get the result. Square root of a negative value. So our domain is any reals bigger than two or equal to two or less than or equal to negative two. 